Hello everyone, myself Saurabh and the topic for today's discussion is Gear System and Design. Uh, let's suppose what is the need for a gear. We know that gear is a power transmission device or you can say power transmission element like shaft, chain drive and belt drive. Then what is the difference between these three one and the gears? We just know that the gear is a positive drive in comparison to friction wheel which is a negative drive. The meaning of positive drive is that there is no slip between gears compared to friction wheels. The limitation of space is much more necessary in case of gear system design. Gears can be mounted in a very very less space while as bell drive, chain drive and shaft can be mounted in a very large space. Third one is higher power capacity can be delivered in case of gear while in case of shaft, bear, uh, gear, uh, bell drive and chain drive it is not recommended. And the third one is reduction ratio variability. <coughs> in gears, just we take an example of our bike or you can say automobile, we plot first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, but we can't do this in case of if power is transferred or delivered in case of shafts, chain drive or belt drive. It means reduction ratio variability can be opted in case of gear system, while in case of shaft, chain drive and belt drive, it can't be opted. That's why we just choose for the gear system in comparison to shaft, chain and belt. Let us take an example, you can say reference of a video which I have taken from the YouTube which is from Chevrolet company which will show you the evolution of gears from the beginning to the right now. Please have a look. Mr. Archimedes of ancient Greece. Long ago, Archie said, Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. What Archimedes meant was that the power of a lever is practically unlimited. Today, almost everyone uses some form of lever in his daily work. The familiar can opener is a lever with a sharp cutting edge. The playground seesaw is just a simple lever too. It takes a lot of force to start a freight car moving, yet the railroad man can start the heaviest freight cars easily with a pinch bar, a powerful lever which turns the wheel. Tough luck, old boy. Here's a place where a lever comes in mighty handy. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10 pound weight on this end, and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. Let's raise the lever in the air, change its shape a little, and we have a crank. Or we can add a second lever and have a double crank. Now the short arm moves one-fourth the distance, but we get four times the force. If we want continuous motion, we need more arms. Now we have levers that turn. The larger paddle wheel makes fewer turns, but it delivers more force. A paddle wheel is nothing but a never-ending series of levers. We can make the wheels stronger and lessen friction where the wheels touch each other, by rounding off the edges and shaping them into teeth that will slide in and out smoothly. Now, the power flows smoothly and continuously through spinning leverage of gear wheels. Gears are made in many kinds and many sizes. Little gears, big gears, worm gears, bevel gears, and even lopsided gears. Over a hundred million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The transmission is located right at the bottom of the gear shift lever. Let's start from scratch and put together a model of the gears that we shift in our motor car. The shaft on the left comes from the engine. The shaft on the right carries the power back to the rear wheels. To connect these two with gears, we'll need another shaft, known as a counter shaft. These two gears 
carry the power from the engine shaft to the counter shaft and are always connected or in mesh. This gear on the drive shaft going to the wheels is free to turn around the shaft. We'll put it in mesh with another gear on the counter shaft. These gears are always in mesh. And keep turning while the engine is running. To switch from one set of gears to another, our transmission needs a short shaft like this, known as a clutch sleeve. It cannot turn on the drive shaft, but it is free to slide back and forth. On the sleeve, we'll mount a large gear, which we can shift back and forth to mesh with the small gear in the middle of the counter shaft. We are now in neutral. The gears that are always in mesh are turning over with the engine, but the shaft to the rear wheels is standing still. A 3,000 pound automobile takes a lot of force to start. So in low speed, we get the greatest leverage by letting the smallest gear on the counter shaft turn the largest gear on the drive shaft. The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. With low gears in mesh, the rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute, about a third the speed of the engine, but with three times the force. The power is going through these gears in the transmission. After we've started the car rolling, we want fast pickup. So we shift into second by sliding the sleeve backward to mesh with this gear on the shaft to the rear wheels. The wheel is now turning at 60 revolutions a minute and the power flows through these gears. For higher speeds, we let the power go directly to the rear wheels. We shift the sleeve forward so that it meshes with the shaft from the engine. The power travels straight from the engine to the drive shaft. Now the shaft to the wheels is turning at 90 revolutions a minute, the same speed as the engine. But here's a problem. An automobile must be able to go backward as well as forward. So we add one more set of gears to reverse the shaft to the rear wheels. With the gears shifted into reverse, the power travels through the transmission in a path like this. We now have three sets of spinning levers for going forward and one for reverse. With a gear shift lever, we can shift to any set of gears we wish. But with all these spinning levers in the transmission came noise and wear. Experts could shift gears quietly by careful timing of the gear shift and the engine speeds, but most of us made plenty of noise until new engineering developments made possible the long series of improvements that followed. When we shifted gears, we got a clash because the gears were not running at the same speed. In other words, not synchronized. So engineers set to work to develop a synchronizer. The synchronizer works like a cork twisted into the top of a bottle. The cork will turn until it is so tight that the bottle turns with it. Synchro mesh works the same way. When we shift into second or high, the synchronizer brings the gears to the same speed before they come together. The drums won't let the gears shift unless they are turning at the same speed. When the gears come together, there is no clash and the shift is made quietly and easily. In the transmission of the up-to-date automobile, we have a powerful low gear to give us a strong spinning leverage in starting. 
a fast-turning motor must set the weight of the car in motion. In second speed, we can change leverage to get going fast at the same engine speed. With a leverage of third gear, power goes directly to the rear wheels, and we can go as fast as we want. Now every driver can shift gears at any time, regardless of speed. Here is a hill that will give us a real chance to see how smoothly and reliably our spinning levers work in our automobile transmission. This driver is going to let her car gain a speed of 60 miles an hour down the hill. Then she will shift into second speed and bring her car easily and safely under control before it reaches the bottom of the hill. Why in case of to know the gear system design, we need some prerequisite to understand this system or you can say this chapter. <coughs> the law of gearing, profile of gear 2 system which is included and cycloid. We know that cycloid system is obsolete right now, only inverse system is <coughs> using right now in the industry or in the, in the universe. Third one is interference, backlash, mechanism involved in the gear like velocity of approach, velocity of races. Classification of gear tool system like on the basis of orientation of shaft like parallel, intersecting, non-parallel, non-intersecting, <coughs> on the basis of teeth are cut internally or externally. In the basis of gear tool system like 20 degree full depth involute, 14.5 degree full depth involute and 20 degree step tooth involute. The terminologies associated with the gear like module, face fit, piss circle diameter of the pinion, piss circle diameter of the gear, reduction ratio, addendum, dedendum, addendum cycle diameter, dedendum cycle diameter, like that. All you people have to be encouraged knowledge of that particular parameter to know the design parameters of gearing system. Now I am coming for the design of Isper gear which is a parallel first system. It means that if the two shafts are in parallel condition then only Isper gear can be mounted. Now if we are going to design a Isper gear system, system needs two at least two parameters for the, for the design, design of this particular system. First one is power capacity delivered and third one is reduction ratio. It means that a designer wants the amount of power which can be transferred from one place to another place and up to which ratio. Suppose that uh, I am taking an example. This we have started our bike. The engine is running at 3000 rpm. But at the time of first gear, we don't need such a rpm because at the time of the start, the rpm of wheel will be 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So reduction of this heavy rpm and power should be reduced. So <coughs> reduction should be given at the level of design, at the time of design. Now <coughs> I am taking just a very very basic example of sugarcane juice machine. We have seen that power is coming in this machine from a diesel engine via V-belt. From V-belt it is coming to a pulley. pulley to gear 1, gear 1 to gear 2. We have noticed that the impeller on which sugarcane is mounted for the juice is a big gear while the gear which is mounted for the running condition is a small gear. We have noticed that ki if we plot the sugarcane on the impeller to crush the sugarcane, torque is required, not RPM is required. We have just noticed that. Only torque is required because at high RPM sugarcane will be slipped while at high torque, so it will not be slipped and it will be cursed properly. Now, take a look at this diagram. If two gears are matching, we know from the terminology associated with that, the gears are in contact with point P, this is called pitch point, that is pitch circle diameter. If a normal force through which, that is called pressure line, along the pressure line, Pn, which is normal force, is acted by this gear to this gear. This PN force can be classified in two ways according to the special angle alpha. 
Pn cos alpha and Pn sin alpha. This Pn cos alpha will be treated as Pt. That is the transmitting force or transmission force. While Pn sin alpha is treated as Pr or you can say radial force. This force is responsible for the transmission capacity or you can say transmission of a power from one point to another point or you can say from one gear to another gear while this PR is responsible for maintaining the intermediate shaft distance now we see that if PT is acted by this gear to this gear the same reaction will be from this gear to this gear it means that if two gears are in mesh condition that PT will be same for both if PT is same for both then what the criteria will be different so that limitation of torque and RPM can be controlled. Now, <coughs> from a diagram we can see that if a tangential force PT is acting or acted on a circular body, only this parameter R can be controlled so that developed torque can be controlled. It means that in the example of sugarcane juice machine, the big diameter means that if PT is same, the torque is greater as the diameter of the gear is greater. So, at the big diameter of a big gear, the torque will be greater. Torque will be greater, crushing will be easier. It means that as the PT is same, only size or you can say radius will decide the value of torque. It means when I am switching from uh, another example of bike, if we put first gear, first gear to second gear, third gear, fourth gear. What we will see in first gear due to static friction and inertia of bike and the human body which is riding right now to overcome that one, overcome that value, we need torque, not RPM. Means that the first gear of an automobile will be bigger. While in case of when we proceed for second, third and fourth gear, in this gear, gearing system, we need RPM and don't torque. In case of RPM reading, it means that continuously from second, third, fourth, the size of gear will be reduced. On the basis of that principle, the overall system is designed, right? <coughs> While if we now consider design consideration, there are two parameters on the basis of any system can be designed. What is exact meaning of design? Design means to calculate and to select. To calculate the dimensions involved and to select the proper material without failure while fulfilling all the needs that is the exact meaning of design it means that we are in case of gears if we define the gears design it means that delivering proper power which is recommended in the machine without failure is termed as gear design there are failure criteria of two type in this case or so in the case of gears the criteria are strength criteria Strength criteria can be categorized or classified in two ways that is SB and SW. SB can be treated as beam strength while SW is treated as wearing strength. Gear can be failed in two ways. First of all, if the gear is engaged like that, if gear is engaged at that point P, most of the chances, most of the chances are there, gear tooth can be baked. Number one. Number two, while continuous in operation, continuous in operation, that this surface will be wear out. There are only two, two chances by which the strength criteria can be classified. If we consider a strength criteria, it means that we will design or we will select such a dimension and select a proper material that while in engagement and while in action, this element will not be broken. And second one is for this profile, we choose a such a optimum hardness so that while in operation it can't be wear out. So, so there are only two criteria by which we are going to design the system. As we see that there is there are two criteria beam strength and wear strength. Let's check it out first beam strength. While considering uh, the, dis the design criteria or in analysis we have P assumed some assumptions like we have to assume that there is no stress concentration between two meshing teeth. As we have seen here, the action of PT is only considered, the action of PR will not be considered as the component, this component is only for shaft maintaining distance and only this component is responsible for power transmission. So, we will not consider this element for the design criteria. 
थर्ड वन इज दैट थर्ड एजेंशन इज दैट लोडिंग शुड बी विद इन इलास्टिक लिमिट इलास्टिक लिमिट इज नॉट लोडिंग विल नॉट बियॉन्ड गो फ्रॉम द इलास्टिक लिमिट नाउ स्विच फॉर दिस क्राइटेरिया दैट इज कॉल्ड बीम स्ट्रेंथ वाई इट इज कॉल्ड बीम और एलिमेंट ऑफ गियर इज कॉलिंग एज बीम नाउ लुक एट दैट इज स्ट्रक्चर दैट इज अ कैंडिलीवर बीम ऑफ लेंथ एल हाइट एच एंड विथ बी लाइक दैट look at this element or you can say look at this element this is the base circle of gear this element is projected from this gear if another gear is acted on gear, this gear that particular gear will act force pt in this direction this can be also shown from that point if the gear is rotating in this direction or you can say anti clockwise direction definitely there is a pt force which is acting along its face width which is just like from that element trying to deflect this element so this projected element can be treated as a static beam or you can say cantilever beam like three dimensions are evolved in this situation length width and height same as from here this t can be treated as two thickness this h can be treated treated as from the root circle to the distance of pitch circle diameter we have seen from this figure also this is pitch point both gears can be only met at this point so we can see that this pt is acted along this pitch circle diameter this is common for both the element this is face width and this is face width if a fair force pt is acted on this element we have to go for this equation which is a very well known equation the gas bending equation m by i and sigma by y m is the maximum bending moment that can be sustained by this element or you can say beam element i is the moment of inertia y is the distance between neutral axis to extreme layer of a element sigma is the maximum allowable bending stress induced while the loading is occurred now if the pt is acted on this element or you can say you can say refer this figure or this figure also it is rotated part this is also rotated part if pt is acted throughout the face width of this element maximum moment that can be transferred is pt into h this is force and that is height and moment will be pt into h moment of inertia like this beam about i x x is bd b h cube divided by 12 same as the moment of inertia about x x axis of this element is bd cube by 12 same as for that from this neutral axis and a if distance between neutral axis to extreme layer is h by 2 from that point that will be t by 2 the maximum bending is to that can be true induced in the element is sigma is equal to my by i or you can say my i by i or you can say m by z section modulus putting all these values on this platform pt into s bd cube by 12 divided by t by 2 we obtain pt is equal to b sigma b t square upon 6h 6 sigma b i have stated sigma here and here sigma b sigma b stand for bending stress right the so pt is equal to that one now multiplying a known parameter module module numerator and denominator that will be m b sigma b and this will be t square upon 6 hm i have already tell you that there are some prerequisite to under understand this situation or this chapter and the prerequisite is the terminologies module came from that terminology t square upon 6 hm which i have shown here is termed as lewis form factor which is given for a given profile and standard tool profile system in your data book which is uh, i can refer mahadevan from uh, in mahadevan the value of lewis form factor is stated for each profile and each tool treating system so pt the maximum force that can be transferred for power gap c is mb sigma b into y now <coughs> we have stated the value of strength criteria and we are discussing beam we are discussing beam strength so the definition of beam strength can be stated as the maximum 
फोर दैट कैन बी सस्टेन बाई अ टीथ एलिमेंट विदाउट फिल्योर विदाउट गोइंग टू फिल्योर स्टैम एज बी मिस्ट्रेंड इट मीन दैट एज यू कैन से दैट एस बी शुड बी ग्रेटर देन और इक्वल टू पी टी इफ लोड इज एक्टेड सपोज दैट वी टेक एग्जाम्पल इफ लोड इज एक्टेड ऑन द एलिमेंट इज फिफ्टी न्यूटन एंड द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ एलिमेंट इज हंड्रेड न्यूटन इट मीन दैट यू गेस गेस सिस्टम इज सेफ एल्स If this is one not one newton and this is hundred newton, the gear system will be failed by beam strength criteria. Now this is over for today.